Okay. And so I believe that I am recording. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, so new dualities from old generating geometric Petri and Wilson dualities and trialities of ribbon graphs. And uh, this is joint work with Lowell Ab Abrams at uh, uh, GWU. Okay, whoa, sorry. Make everybody seasick here. Okay, so the big picture here is that we want to systematically generate self-dual graphs of all kinds of duality and triality, so not just geometric duals. Um, this is going to involve taking duals and twists at the individual edge level, not just globally. Uh, Bill, what's up? Nothing. I just I just shut off my video. Oh, okay. Your hand went up. That's all right. Um, what we're going to be able to do here in order to um, get a handle on this problem is we're gonna be able to reduce it all to considering just one vertex graphs. And it turns out that all dualities and trialities for all embedded graphs are encoded at the level of one vertex graphs with just a bunch of loops. These one vertex graphs can be analyzed systematically. We've got a computer program that does it. Um, once you've got a handle on what all the one vertex graphs are doing, you can then, um, solve this lovely commutative diagram to generate general embedded graphs with the um, duality and triality um, properties that you want. You can also play the same game, not just with one vertex graphs, but with the automorphism groups of um, any graph with particularly rich automorphism groups to generate new du dualities and trialities in that graph's orbit. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to be working with cellularly embedded graphs. So here we have a cellularly embedded graph. Um, this is a, a band decomposition, which is another way of representing a cellularly embedded graph. You just fatten up the vertices to disks and the edges into sort of other disks. The faces become other disks. And if you remove the face disks, you get something, a represent, representation called a ribbon graph. Okay, so these are all equivalent. Most of the drawings in this um, and, and ways we'll talk, be talking about this are going to be in terms of ribbon graphs because it's the easiest way to um, draw the figures. Um, so for example, if you want something non-orientable like this K4 in the projective plane, it's easier to give the half twist to one of those ribbons than it is to be drawing the cross caps. Um, this is a non-cellularly embedded graph. We won't be seeing those. Okay. Um, and I have lovely co-authors who also draw gorgeous pictures. So um, there's a mix of lovely figures in here from various people. Okay, so some operations on a whole graph. So this is um, a work of Wilson's from um, in the late 70s. So the Wilson group has two operators on an entire graph. It's either taking the geometric dual of a graph, okay, and if you remember taking the geometric dual of graph, it's just like what you do in a plane, you put a vertex in each of the faces and you connect two vertices if they're separated by an edge. Okay, um, the Petri dual is what you get from a ribbon graph. If you take each ribbon, detach it, give it a half twist and stick it back onto its vertex. Um, equivalently, if you take an embedded graph, you use the same vertices and the same edges but for faces, you replace the usual facial walks around the disc by left-right walks. You walk along an edge, you turn right. When you get to the next vertex, you turn left. Those give you left-right walks, and those become the new faces of the Petri dual of the graph. Okay, 
taking the geometric dual and the Petri dual, our op global operations on the graph, the two operations do not commute. So they give you two new operations on the graph. And they, these two generate an action of S3 on the space of graphs. The kinds of things that people want to know are when are these operations stable? When do you get self-dual graphs, self-petrial graphs, self-duality, I mean self-triality, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, two loops in the Klein bottle. It's all three. It's self-dual, it's self-petrial, it's self-trial. It's a real symmetric, cute little object, right? You can easily see that it's self-petrial because if you give both of these edges a half twist, you get the same thing as you started with. Um, we're going to refer to all of these different kinds of uh, dualities and trialities in aggregate as self -tuality, tualities. Um, boy, if we could come up with a better term, we would be happy. This is the million dollar question actually here, is what do you call these things in aggregate? We need a word that's got all of the same um, grammatical construct as dual but encompasses both duality at order in two and three kinds of things. So there it is. <coughs> okay, so special graphs. Um, Wilson was looking at these. He was actually not looking at these. He was looking at regular maps, so much, much bigger objects. And there are many examples of graphs which are self-dual, but are neither self-petrial or self-trial, okay? So two loops in the torus is self-dual. There are lots and lots of graphs that are self-petrial, but not self-dual nor self-trial, okay? Um, these two loops in the projective plane. There are also um, a goodly number of graphs that are all three. Okay, they're self-petrial, self-dual, self-trial. They're invariant under the entire group. However, just self-trial graphs, um, they're invariant under taking a twist dual, but they are not self-petrial nor self-dual, are very, very hard to come by. Um, the smallest regular map with this property um, has 126 edges and characteristic minus 70, so it's huge. And that's the smallest possible. All right, why is this so hard? So if you're a self trial graph, that means that if you take your dual and then take the Petri dual of that, you end up back where you came from. In other words, it means that your geometric dual is equal to your Petri dual, okay? Now your geometric dual is always in the same surface as the graph, that's generally not true of your Petri dual. Petri dual may not even be orientable, right? Um, the Petri dual, though, always has the same underlying abstract graph as the original graph. So this is pretty powerful. So to get a graph that's self trial but not self-dual nor self-petrial, you have to have the dual and the petrial both with the same underlying graph as G, in the same surface as G, but different embeddings than G. So that's why this is so hard. Um, again, particularly for regular maps. But what if you don't restrict yourself to regular maps? What if you just look at graphs? In this case, there are lots of really little examples, things you can get your hands on. So here's an example of a graph G, if you take its Petri dual or its dual, you get the same thing over here. This over here is um, clearly the Petri dual, right? If you untwist these two edges or you twist these two edges, they untwist, put a half twist in this one. So there's the Petri dual. But it turns out that that's also the geometric dual, okay? Um, so those two are equal. 
but if you look at their embedding in the surface, there's the embedding of G in the surface. It's not the same embedding as its geometric dual or its Petri dual. So G is not self-dual and it's not self-Petri dual, but it is self-trio. So what we would like to be able to do is generate all self-trial, but not self-dual or self-petrial graphs. In fact, we would like to have a systematic way to find all graphs of any kind of self-duality our little hearts desire, because we're just greedy people. Okay, so here's how you go about systematically generating these new dualities. There's a very simple classical result that underlies this idea. So if you have any graph that's self-dual, okay, and if you've got some other graph that's in its orbit under the Wilson group, so G is do something to H, then G is self whatever you get by conjugating. So you get new kinds of dualities by conjugation when you're doing the global Wilson group. So what we have now is an algebraic framework that's much more powerful. It's going to let us manipulate each edge individually, and it's going to let us handle isomorphisms, a kind of weak duality, okay? And it's going to work by applying those Wilson group operations one edge at a time instead of globally, and by using permutations to track isomorphism. So, Here's how you do those ribbon operations on just a single edge instead of on the whole graph. So here's the uh, K4 in the projective plane that we saw before, and we're going to be operating on this edge right here. Okay. If you twist that edge, it just puts a half twist, it unsticks one end, turns it over once, and sticks it back on. Not a problem. To take the partial dual of this edge, this was uh, Shmutov's um, partial duality, and it really sort of was a game changer in topological graph theory. To do that, you take this edge and use it to make all of this one vertex. So down here, all this yellow stuff is now one vertex. And the new edge the null dual edge attaches from one side to the other of that. Um, sort of like if you were doing the full dual, the new edge in the full dual would go from one side to the other side of the face. It would sort of run perpendicular to the original edge. You can think of this uh, new green edge as running perpendicular to the original edge, but we're only doing one edge at a time. Okay. So you twist, you dual, you twist again. There it is. Or you can go in the other direction. You can first dual, then you take the twist of that. See this little bit right here that came out. So we gave a half twist to that edge. And then if you dual again, you end up here. So action in S3, right? Twist, dual, twist is the same as dual, twist, dual. And that's the, uh, full orbit um, for that one edge in that graph. But you can do this to any subset of the edges. Okay. Isomorphism matters. Some graphs are strongly self-dual or self-petrial. So this graph here, if you take the dual there it is, it doesn't matter what edge maps to what edge, you're still gonna get an isomorphism. This graph down here is weakly self-dual, okay? If you take the dual of it, you have to map E to F and F to E. Okay, there's some permutation of the edges you have to keep track of. Um, <clears throat> the twists propagate through cycles and they cancel up to parity. So if I put a half twist on both of these edges, right, if I took the, the um, Petri dual here, those twists would propagate through and cancel each other. So this graph is also self-petrial. 
This graph down here is weekly self petriel. If I take the petri dual of this, again, I have to map E to F and F to E in order to get the isomorphism. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the algebraic framework that lets us manipulate these guys. We work with pairs of a ribbon graph and an edge ordering. The edge ordering is just to keep track of which edges are having what done to them. The um, ribbon graph group acts on ribbon graphs with n edges by just applying one of those S3 operations to each edge, but it could be a different one to each edge. In order to keep track of the permutations, we take the wreath product or the semi-direct product of <clears throat> the action on the edges and the ability to permute the edges. Okay, so basically you have um, a list of operations that are gonna happen on the edges and then a permutation and it's gonna act by replacing, uh, reordering the edges and then applying the right operations to the edges in the right order. What this gives us is a commutative diagram and a strategy for finding the objects that we want. What you do is you find something convenient and lovely down here. So something that is unchanged by some tuality operation. So you found something lovely down here. You have what you want up here and you solve for the operation to get a graph with the desired tuality problem. This guy that you get here will then be self your favorite map. So all you need to do in order to generate lots and lots of graphs that have the tuality properties that you want is just so find something down here to work with that you've got control over. And those are gonna be the one vertex ribbon graphs, okay? Every connected um, embedded graph has a single vertex oriented graph in its orbit. And the way you get that is simply by taking any edge that goes between two separate vertices and taking the partial dual with respect to it because that merges the two vertices. And you just keep sucking those in, those extra edges in, until you're down to a one vertex graph. One vertex graphs correspond to chord diagrams and we have code that'll generate all chord diagrams. Um, <clears throat> checking for isomorphism on chord diagrams is easy. You're just looking at the dihedral group. You got a lot of control on this level. Um, but what turns out is because of that commutative diagram, all forms of self-tuality propagate through the entire orbit. And that means that the whole theory of all graph tualities can be captured by these one vertex ribbon graphs. So you just find any one vertex graph with some kind of um, a tuality stabilizer and then solve for the nice kind of duality that you want up here. Okay, um, I'm just about out of time. So let me not talk about the actual code for doing this. We can do it. Um, so here's an example. Here is some graph. We ran it through the computer program. We found out that with respect to this little bizarre thing, it's self-tool. But that's just a bizarre thing. I want something that's self-treal. So I put these two pieces of information into this commutative diagram. I solve for the alpha. There it is. I apply that alpha, and this graph here is now self trial not self-dual, not self-petrial, and different from the ones that we saw previously, and we know that there's exactly five other solutions. Um, you can do the same game here. Instead of using one vertex graphs and having to do a computer search, you can also, as your convenient thing down here, 
um, put any element of the automorphism group. And this also sheds some pretty sharp light on why the regular maps were the original hunting grounds for these kinds of dualities. Um, because they will simply let you solve for the dualities that you want. Um, so here's an example of something with a nice automorphism group, okay? If you take the automorphism group that spins this a third of the way around, if you spin and solve, you get this graph, which is not a regular map, but it's self-trial and it's not self-petrial and not self-dual. And this also extends to an infinite family of self-trial only graphs. You know, you just make this bigger and bigger. Um, so take home here is that there are now systematic tools to study self-duality, any kind of self-duality, petrality, whatever you want on <coughs> any graphs, not just regular maps. This information is encoded in single vertex graphs. We have code to systematically generate those. And we've generated all, all the graphs of any kind of duality up to like eight edges or something now. Um, or if you've got particular automorphism groups and you want to be working with regular maps, you can use the automorphism groups to generate more objects that have the duality properties that you want. So there we go. Thank you all very much. And I just unmuted you all. Oh, thanks for your attention. Were you able to hear okay? Joe, can I ask you yeah. questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. We've got a few. We got a few minutes before Bill starts up. Okay, so um, can I start with a question on slide number ten? Um, yeah. 13, 14, 12, 10. Okay, so I'm looking on the right side and I'm trying to figure out how you do that last regular dual. From here to here? Yeah, yeah, what's going on there? So it looks like you're twisting the vertex and that is not a thing. Yeah, um, the, taking the dual here of this edge splits off a, um, yeah. The short answer is that the dual of a twisted loop is again the twisted loop. If you take a, the, the geometric dual of a twisted loop, that twisted loop only has one face. That becomes the vertex. You're still unoriented, so the, the edge that you're left with still has a twist in it. So okay, I see. A twisted loop is self-dual. So I just would have had to have drawn it out is the point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you can do that if you, you do the same thing here. You turn this guy yellow and you put a loop on it. But when you turn this guy yellow, the vertex becomes twisted. And then you've got the loop attached to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, similar question, actually. So when you're looking at these ribbon graphs, mm -hmm. Are you just used to reading them so you can instantly see the surface? Or is there some easy way of no. computing the surface other than literally reading it? Um, so usually, like, I have the thing where I do all the face tracing and glue the disks on and figure out what surface I have. Yeah, I don't even think about the surface um, at all anymore because the faces do these weird torquey things in space and they're just hard to visualize. So you take them out so I don't have to think about them. Yeah, but somehow you have labeled the diagrams as to what the surfaces are. Like you're like, oh, this is on the projective planar rotor, and sometimes I can see what it is, and other times I'm like, oh, just, I don't immediately just compute see. the Euler characteristic. Uh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, if, if you're if you're looking at one of these diagrams, <coughs> can't you locate uh, one face oh, by yeah. tracing along an edge, uh, 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 tracing along the the edges? Of a, uh, of a of a of a vertex circle and uh, and ribbon until you get back to the place you started yeah. and that traces the uh, that traces the the boundary of, of a single face. Mm -hmm. Oh right, exactly I was just Sarah wondering Marie if there was, was a saying. fast way. Yeah, no, that's exactly what Sarah Marie <laughs> was saying, and she was just looking for a faster way to do it. 
Um, and yeah. the answer is, yeah, there isn't one. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're just sewing okay. the, back into the faces. Yeah. Um, I don't want to start Bill late. Um, 30 seconds, I can take one more, one more question and then we'll transition to Bill. And if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to hang out. Are there any other questions? I'm, I'm interested in how everyone felt about the presentation. I, I, I felt it went, it ended up going kind of fast because you didn't have people signaling you, perhaps, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I felt that, that it went a little fast. Um, I'm not an expert in topological graph theory, but I wonder how people felt about the pace. That's actually a good point. It may be that that's a warning that we need to give speakers that they have to go slower and spend more time on slides than they would in a regular talk where they can get a sense of their pacing from their audience. What do folks think? I thought the pacing was fine myself, but I wasn't sure if I should be asking questions in the middle or waiting till the end. Mm -hmm. We all love the video conferences at work. And I find that the key is to go at approximately the same pace as if you were taking a talk, uh, like giving a normal talk, but then um, do, exactly, uh, do exactly what you just said. Don't be, um, don't be shy about interrupting in the middle, just butt right in and say, no, I have a question, can you please go back and go slower over something? And that seems to work pretty, uh, pretty well for all the VTCs that, that we did, so. Yeah, I think the the pace was was uh, fine. What may help is to uh, more frequently use the pointer so that the participants see uh, what you're referring to on the graphics. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if the system had a a, a, a more noticeable pointer, uh, it would yeah. help. Or if, or if speakers uh, got into the habit of, of keeping the pointer moving, mm -hmm. wiggling it when they're, when they're pointing out an element of, the, of their diagram. Okay. Like if, if uh, as I see the pointer is fixed now, could you move it around? Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so well, okay, one, 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 one issue that I that on my on on the on on the setup I have, my own pointer, and your pointer have identical icons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I saw your pointer move, and then I realized when I moved my pointer, I could tell which one is my pointer. So during the talk, I sometimes confused. Uh -huh. I mistook my pointer for your pointer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, so let's see how this handoff goes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and hopefully Bill's going to share his. Let's see how it goes. And let's see how it goes. Hi, Bill. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Oh, and hi, everybody new. This is cool. So, um, so I'm, I'm getting a, a list of things that I can share, but none of them is my Beamer presentation. So... Um, so, um, let's see what, what you're seeing. I'm seeing your Zoom screen. <laughs> and if you... Oh, look at that. There we go. Beautiful. Now. And so, if I go here... Yep. You see my screen? Okay. And I see your beautiful face. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, so okay. if I... Do you have the ability to mute everybody, Bill? Except for yourself, or do I only, am I the only godlike powered person here? I think you're the only one who can do that. Okay, so if I mute everybody and Bill unmutes himself, are we good with that? Go for it. Okay. Okay, and Bill. Okay, am I? Who can talk? And I'll mute myself. Okay, it sounds like I'm. Uh, you can hear me. So uh, thanks very much for coming to the second part of this colloquium. This is uh, an experiment that Joe and I have been talking about for over a year, and uh, it's it's exciting to uh, have you folks here. So I'm going to just talk briefly about um, 
trying to import some algebra, or I guess you, you could say trivial algebraic geometry into combinatorial design theory. Um, this is a paper that's just shown up on the archive uh, joint with Doug Stinson at Waterloo. So uh, Doug is my co-author and I want to thank him. Uh, let's start with the uh, most familiar combinatorial design. The final plane has seven points and there are seven, seven points, seven lines, uh, three points per line and three lines per point. Any two points are joined by a unique line. Any two lines intersect in a unique point. And what I want to do is I want to think of polynomial functions on this, on this set of points, um, on the set of blocks, I should say, on the set of lines. So um, the point set here is now uh, the integers mod 7. So we have Z7. And uh, because the quadratic residues are 1, 2, and 4, I can take cyclic shifts of the quadratic residues to find these seven blocks. So uh, perhaps uh, this line over here, on, on the top left is 0, 1, 3, and then uh, this might be 1, 2, 4, and so on. Um, and this might be 2, 3, 5 at the bottom. So these are the seven lines, these are the seven blocks of the design, and I want to find a way to uh, study polynomial functions on this set. So a lot of pieces of algebraic combinatorics, at least let's say spectral graph theory kind of algebraic combinatorics, really um, embedded in these areas are ways of uh, studying polynomial functions on combinatorial objects. So how are we going to do this? So there are the set of blocks, and now I'm going to identify each block with a 0, 1 vector. So this block up here, 0, 1, 3, uh, corresponds to this vector of length 7 <clears throat> with positions 0, 1, and 3 equal to 1, and positions 2, 4, 5, and 6 equal to 0. Is that clear? Yep. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to think of these seven vectors in, in real seven-dimensional real space or complex space, and I'd like to find the ideal of all polynomials that vanish at just these seven points. So usually if you do non-trivial algebraic geometry, you're interested in the set of polynomials that vanish on some curve or some, some more complex variety. But for this talk, all we're doing is looking at finite sets. We want to characterize the polynomials that vanish just at the, these seven points in this, in this sense, these vectors of length seven. My cursor gets large when I shake it a lot in case I lose it. Um, so notice that the unique triple that contains both zero and one also contains three. So I can take the polynomial x0 times x1 minus x0 times x3, and suppose I have a 0, 1 vector, um, which, which, vanish, uh, which is a 0 of this polynomial. If I have a 0, 1 vector, if it contains, if that 0, 1 vector has both 0 and first position equal to 1, then it must have the third position equal to 1. And so for any two points, I can build this, this little quadratic polynomial that sort of instructs me to, to make x3 equal to 1 whenever x0 and x1 are equal to 1. So if I assume for the time being that I've got a way to make sure that all of my, all of my zeros of my ideal have entries equal to 0 and 1, then here, these little tricks, these uh, quadratic polynomials, throwing them into a generating set G of polynomials um, will give me an ideal with seven choose two quadratic generators, and then I'm going to put in generators that say x1 squared is equal to x1. So I'll have x1 squared minus x1, x2 squared minus x2. And then I'll also require that the sum of the x's, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4, x5, x6, and x6, and sorry, x0 up to x6, that they sum up to three to guarantee that these zero one vectors in the zero set of my ideal all have exactly three ones and exactly four zeros. So this is the first example. And what I'm saying here is that if I toss in these little uh, quadratic generators together with those basic trivial generators, these generate the ideal of that finite variety. So that's the example that I'm going to use to motivate this. And here's the general setup. I have a K uniform hypergraph. So I got a set of size V, we'll call it X. These are my points. And every block or every hyperedge 
has exactly k points in it. So I have a collection of k element subsets, which I'll call blocks because I'm using design theory language here. And now <clears throat> we take the polynomial ring where there's one variable for each point. And I'm just going to abbreviate that in this talk as C bracket X, this ring of polynomial and B variables, complex coefficients. And I'm going to try to find all of the polynomials that vanish each block. And when I say the polynomial vanishes at the block B, what I mean is that it vanishes at the zero one vector C sub B. That's a vector of length V with entries equal to zero or one, depending on whether the element is in the block B or not. So these zero one vectors, they're exactly um, cardinality of script B of these. And I want to find all the polynomials that vanish at those points. And this is, this is an ideal. I can also think of this as the kernel of an evaluation map. So I can take all of the polynomials in B variables and I can evaluate them on these vectors. And these polynomials, of course, polynomials of wildly different degrees can all have the same, all reduced to the same function when evaluated on, the, on these blocks. And this equivalence relation is captured by this idea, which is the kernel of that evaluation map. So there's some basic um, notation and some basic facts uh, from commutative algebra or algebraic geometry, whichever you like, some basic things that you might know from your ring theory. First, if I have a set of points, script S is a set of points in, in, in space, the ideal of S is a set of all polynomials and V variables, which vanish at each of those points. In the other direction, if G is a set of polynomials, we define the script Z of G, script Z of G <clears throat> to be the set of zeros, the set of points in V-dimensional space, such that all of those polynomials in the generating set vanish at that point. So our set is finite. In, in this talk. And so as, as long as the set is finite, if I take a set S of points and I find the ideal of that set of points, and then I find the zero set of that ideal, then I get the this, this set back because it's a Zariski closed set. So this is usually the, the operation of Zariski closure, but in this case, it's trivial. The Nolstellan set says if I, op, if I apply the operations in the opposite direction, if I have an ideal J, and I take the zero set of J and then find the ideal of all polynomials that vanish at those zeros, then I get the radical of J. That is all of the polynomials G such that some power of G belongs to J. So the standard example is if I take um, just single, single variable polynomials over the reals and I take the ideal generated by X squared, the only real point where that vanishes is the real number zero. But if I take all the polynomials that vanish at zero, I also get X. So the ideal generated by X is the, is the ideal of that single point because X, that polynomial X squared belongs to my ideal generated by X squared. Is that clear? I'll assume so. An ideal is radical if it's already equal to uh, it's, it's radical. So if rad j is equal to j, we call j a radical ideal. And we're going to um, need all of the ideals that we build to be radical in order for them to be the ideal of a set, um, of a finite set. So there's a little bit of technical stuff that I'm going to skip over that checks that an ideal is radical. So here's a trivial example. So now we take the complete uniform hypergraph. So K sub K V is the set of all K element subsets of a set of size V. So script K is this complete uniform hypergraph, collection of all K element subsets. And the generating set for the, this ideal is this simple thing that we talked about verbally before. First, I have to require that all of the entries in my zero one vector add up to K. That's this first linear polynomial. And these quadratic polynomials, xi squared minus xi, guarantee that every entry is a zero or a one. So it's easy to prove. We, we just have to compute the Jacobian and check that each of these points is a smooth point. It's a risky tangent space is full dimensional, each of these points. And we find out that the ideal of this set is exactly um, the ideal generated by these simple polynomials. And indeed, that the zero set of that ideal is exactly the points that we want. So we call this, from, for the rest of the talk, we're going to call that the trivial ideal. I have to check my time here. Um, my, um, 
Okay, so that ideal is that uh, generating set is going to be called G0, and the uh, ideal is going to be script T. Now, if I look at a T design, I'd like to think of this algebraically. So for each subset of points, we associate this monomial, which is just the product of the variables uh, indexed by those points. And for a block v, B, so a subset B, the value of that monomial at the point B is one if C is a subset of B and it's zero otherwise, obviously. A k-uniform hypergraph is, is called a t-design or a t-vk lambda design, and, or we say it has strength t, if every t-element subset lies in exactly lambda blocks in script B. So they're exactly lambda blocks that contain t for any t-element subset. That's a t-design. And it's easy to check that every t-design is also an s-design, and this s is just a uh, lambda times some binomial coefficient divided by another, but I'm going to need this, I'm, I'm going to need you to believe that this kind of identity holds true when I get to the, the first theorem. So Del Sartre proved, and various other people have rediscovered this, that designs are essentially ways to approximate the large space. What you want to do is you want to approximate the collection of all k-element subsets of a set of size v with a very small collection of k-element subsets that are wi wisely chosen. And the approximation rule, the test statistics that we're going to apply are polynomial functions of degree at most t. So a, a set x, a, a pair xb is a t design on x, if and only if the average over these blocks of any polynomial in v variables of total degree at most t is exactly equal to its average over the complete uniform hypergraph. So a, a t design is exactly a set which gives exactly, which gives the same average as the complete uniform hypergraph for any polynomial of degree at most t. So this is the definition, these are the definitions of the things that I want to study. When I'm looking for generating sets for these ideals, I'm not really worried about finding a most efficient generating set or the smallest generating set. I want a generating set which, in which all the polynomials have very low degree. So in order to get polynomials of low degree, I'm not worried about the number of them. In fact, I'd prefer them to be invariant under the automorphism group of the, of, of the design. So the geometry may have a very large automorphism group, in which case I may have very many generators, but I want the degree to be small. So I define gamma one of this design to be the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial in the ideal. So it's the smallest degree of f over all f in the ideal that aren't in the trivial ideal. And gamma two is the smallest uh, the, the smallest um, S such that the ideal is generated by some collection of polynomials all of degree at most S. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the two parameters I want to understand. So if you're a graph theorist, you might, um, you might see, see this as sort of weird, but the dual of these objects in graph theory are gamma one is essentially the girth of a graph, or let's say half the girth, and gamma two up to a scalar is the, um, is the smallest k such that the homotopy group of the graph is generated by um, closed walks of length k. That's a little bit cryptic, but I apologize for that. So gamma one is the smallest possible degree of a non-trivial polynomial that vanishes on each block, and gamma two is the smallest integer s such that our ideal is generated by a bunch of polynomials having degree at most s. Obviously, gamma one is at most gamma two. When the two are equal, things are kind of interesting. We'll see some examples at the end of the talk. If the design has large strength, if we have large T, then all the polynomials of low degree are trivial. Suppose I have a T design. If I have a non-trivial polynomial that vanishes at every block, its degree has to be larger than T over two. So if I had a 10 design, then I would know that there are no non-trivial polynomials in the ideal of degree less than six. So gamma one is always at least t plus one over two. An easy upper bound is you can always build a generating set for any k uniform hypergraph. You can build a generating set with polynomials of degree at most k. So then you never have to go above the, the, the block size for your degree. 
But um, Stinson and I constructed infinitely many triple systems. So these are designs with, with block size three, where gamma two is exactly k. So we think that for very messy objects, you can often get exactly k. But for beautiful objects, you should get things that are smaller, get, get gamma two smaller than k. So now I'm going to prove this theorem that the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial is bigger than t over 2. So suppose you had a polynomial in the ideal whose degree is at most t over 2. Write this polynomial as some polynomial with real coefficients plus i times another polynomial with real coefficients. And then, of course, each of these f and g have degree at most t over 2. Our zero set is a bunch of 0, 1 vectors. All the entries are real. So if capital F is in our ideal, then both little f and little g are in the ideal as well. So let's take, take them one at a time. Um, little f is in the ideal and has degree at most t over 2. So f squared is in the ideal. But now f squared has degree at most t, and it's non-negative. It's a non-negative polynomial of degree at most t. By the above lemma, by Delsart's lemma, its average over the blocks is exactly the average over the complete uniform hypergraph. But it's zero at every block, so its average over the blocks is zero. And if its average over the blocks is zero, its average over the complete uniform hypergraph is zero. But it's non-negative, and a non-negative function with an average of zero must be exactly zero everywhere. So therefore, it's zero on every single k element subset, and therefore, this f is in the trivial ideal. The same thing applies to um, to g. So if f squared is, is non-negative everywhere, it must evaluate to zero in the incidence vector of every k set. So it belongs to the ideal of the, of the uh, complete uniform hypergraph. The ideal is radical. It contains f squared, so it also contains f. So f is trivial. So that's the basic proof that the degree has to grow up, go up as the, as the uh, strength of the design goes up. So we have for Steiner systems, for example, a Steiner system is a VK lambda design where lambda is equal to one. That is, every T set is contained in a unique block. Lambda is equal to one. And so we already have that gamma one is at, uh, larger than T over two. Gamma two is at least gamma one. And then we can prove that gamma two is at most T. We can find a generating set. It's very simple. We take the trivial generators, uh, G zero, together with the, these gluing generators. So this is just a polynomial, a difference of two monomials of degree t. So we take two t element subsets that belong to the same block, and we take the difference of the corresponding monomials. And this forces any block that contains capital T also to contain capital T prime. And so this is the way we glue the, the t sets together according to which blocks they belong in, and we get an upper bound of t on the, um, on, on the value gamma 2. So now we have a generating set, but we think that we can do better than t. For a Steiner system, we wonder whether these, um, these sums of these, uh, so this is, this is the sum of all uh, t element monomials whose ind indices belong to capital B. We don't know if that's a basis for the coordinate ring. We'd like to find bases for the coordinate rings, and we do in many cases, but I, I won't spend time on that. In fact, we had that upper bound gamma 2 at most t, and that was for lambda equal 1. But in fact, even if we just have the property that every t set is in at most one block, then gamma 2 is still less than or equal to t. So that gives us an upper bound uh, in terms of the block intersection numbers. So if every block, pair of blocks intersect in less than s points, then gamma 2 is at most s because such a design is a partial s design, a partial uh, Steiner, s, uh, Steiner system. I hope that that is clear. So now there are upper bounds. And now what I want to do is just uh, go to some of the more important examples. So symmetric two designs. So these are two designs, such as projective planes, projective geometries, biplanes, and things like this, where the number of blocks is exactly equal to the number of points. So a symmetric two design is where the size of script B is exactly V. In this case, we can build generators in addition to the trivial generators, G, G naught. We also build a generator which tells us that modulo the ideal, every quadratic xi times xj reduces to a linear function. This is the sum over uh, sum of all, all xi's. I noticed that I didn't define this. X 
capital X sup B comma one is the sum of all the variables in B. So here for every I and J, we, um, we, we have a way to reduce that modulo the ideal to a linear function. So every single function on, on the blocks of a two design, a symmetric two design, every single function is equivalent to a linear function. And the coordinate ring uh, has a basis of consisting of these cosets coming from the monomials. There's a similar result for um, the e-dimensional subspaces of a projective geometry, which um, I, I'll just omit. And the most famous T designs for T larger than two are the, the uh, orbits of the Matthew groups, the wit designs. So there's a 52481 design that corresponds to the minimum weight code words of the extended binary Golay code and the 51261 design coming from the ternary Golay code. And here we know that gamma one is, is larger than T over two. So gamma one is at least three. And it turns out that for every one of these designs, gamma one is exactly at that lower bound. And gamma two, the ideal is generated by polynomials of the smallest possible degree we get polynomials uh, that generate the ideal. And it's no coincidence that these things correspond to designs that generate, um, that induce Q polynomial subschemes inside the association scheme. But that's for another talk. Thanks for your time. Dang. Question. <laughs> We'd have 16 hours of driving between yeah. the end of the 28th and the middle of the 29th. But we're staying there two nights, right? Mark, Mark we're staying in Traverse City two nights, right? Who's that? Uh, hi, Bill. So I would like to ask a question. Yes, yeah. please basically make a remark. So this reminds me a bit of the work of Lajos Roniai from Hungary, who I think 2000, he, uh, him and his uh, co-authors have been working on exactly like understanding the same ideals of set families, but they're more interested in uh, finding the Grobner basis of these ideals and then applying them to extremal combinatorial problems. So if you want, I can send you a survey of some of the work that they have. Yes, there are there are a number of um, a number of other uh, other uh, papers that that um, study. In particular, they're working in in, in uh, positive characteristic. So a lot of papers, uh, polynomial method and combinatorics has been very yeah, sure. powerful, and um, and they're typically working in positive characteristic. One thing I, I did not get to mention is that <laughs> we can always build a uh, generating set for our ideal. Uh, polynomials with integer coefficients. And therefore, um, these things all reduce mod p, and that maps this ideal into the ideal and the positive characteristic, but we don't know when that's equal to the, uh, uh, equal to the ideal and positive characteristic. Yeah. yeah, I see what you're talking about, but this one, I think they study over arbitrary fields, like the work that Lajos Roniai has done specifically. It's about computing Grobner basis of these ideals and using that. It's not just the typical polynomial method of, for example, Kutlev Park or these things. It's a bit different from uh, that. And I went through a paper. I didn't see that being mentioned. So that's why I thought maybe I should uh, mention it too. And then you can have a look at what they are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So do we have any other questions for Bill? No? Are we all set? All right, well, let's, um, those of you that I haven't muted, uh, let's thank Bill. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Um, and very much thank all of you for participating in this. I um, I hope you'll come back. We'll probably um, I'm run this roughly the same time of month in, in, uh, in April um, and uh, see how it goes from there. But um, we're hoping to make this a regular thing. So we welcome your feedback. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, Barry. Thank you, Joe. Oh, okay, Thanks. bye. Yeah, bye. thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, Ada showed up. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, uh, I just finished teaching. Hi, Ada. Awesome. Hi.
I, I, I lost my ability to get back to um, our, our format. 